Hey everyone, I'm here for it. I hope you are ready. We're going to read chapter 13 of this book and it is starting to get to the point in the book, which is some of my favorite stuff. Sorry, my cat is distracting me because she's playing with something. It's like, oh, it's so good from here on out. So I'm hoping that I will be diligent about making you guys a video every day because it is so good. Inga, I hope you are still listening. All my students at school, I hope you are still listening. And with that being said, let's read chapter 13, The Trap Door. Bong, 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 bong. Straining her ears, Emily counted as the gloomy clock, muffled by endless layers of stone walls, kneeled the hours of her dark cell. Bong, 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 bong. 11 o'clock, and still no sign of Kipper. Of course, he had not arrived until midnight the night before, so there was time yet for him to put in an appearance. Emily shut her eyes tight, thinking that if she could doze off in time, the time would pass more quickly. Then all at once, her eyes flew back open. Voices. Then all at once, um, she heard the sound of voices breaking through the heavy silence from somewhere. Emily stiffened, staring wide-eyed into the darkness and listening. Was somebody coming to see her? Neither Kipper, nor Tilly, nor Aunt Twice would likely to be let themselves be heard by visiting the prisoner at this hour. Who then? It was impossible to tell. Like the clock, the voices were muffled, and they had a curious hollow echo to them. But there was something else quite startling about the voices. They seemed to be coming from somewhere under the floor of the remembrance room. Closer and closer drew the voices until they were almost under the bench where Emily lay, and then gradually they began to fade away until at last they disappeared altogether. Emily shivered. Was the darkness playing tricks on her? How could voices be coming from under a cellar floor? It wasn't possible. In the end, persuaded that she must have been crazed from being alone in the dark, and had imagined the whole thing, she drifted into a restless sleep. She had no idea what time it had become when she was startled into sudden awareness by the sound of a key grating in a rusty lock of her cell and then being carefully removed. Ready to feign sleep in a moment, she watched the door slowly open. A brass lantern with a wick turned down low appeared around the door and right behind her, it was Kipper. Evening, Emily, he said, calm and as sunny as the day at the shore and just as cheerful. Emily could only stare at him speechless with happiness and surprise at seeing him right before her in the cell. Fear and the memory of strange voices imagined in the dark suddenly vanished. Come now, ain't you gonna say anything? Tuna got your tongue, as Pa always said. Kipper grinned. Emily threw her hands to the, her mouth. Kipper! Once again, as promised, come to help you run away, Emily. Run away, stammered Emily. That's right. Run away to pause in my place, said Kipper. Least ways till you could find a safer spot. Run away? Emily had never considered the possibility, but now the door to her prison was unlocked and she could run away. She had a place to run to, which was an enormous consideration, and someone to look after her. Run away. The answer to everything. Or was it? I can't, said Emily. Can't? Kipper exploded. Why not, Emily? This place addled your brain already? I don't think so. It's just that. It just what? Kipper interrupted impatiently. You best come up with some good explanation, Emily. Well, what do you suppose would happen if I ran away? Said Emily defiantly. Mrs. Meeching would believe that someone in Sugar Hill Hall had let me out. And who would be punished for it? It could be anyone she chose. Poor Aunt Twice or Mrs. Plumley or even one of the old people. It could even be Mrs. Poovy or Mr. Bottle or anyone. So I can't run away much as I want to. I can't, Kipper. Kipper scratched an ear. I guess I never thought about that, Emily, but you're right. I'm blessed if you ain't. Dang snake lady. Well, he said with a deep sigh, ain't much left to say except and I will come back to see you as often as I can. Emily struggled to keep a solemn face. Someone else will be coming to see me often too. I expect you mean Tilly, who will be bringing your lumps of bread and some other outstanding Sugar Hill Hall wictuals. I guess you ain't going to be happy about seeing her for more than one reason. For your information, I will be happy to see Tilly. Now, 
what do you make of that? Emily could no longer see, keep the happy smile from her face. What I will make of it is that you just as addled as you can be, replied Kipper. What's Tilly done now to repent her wicked deeds? It's what Tilly hasn't done, Kipper, cried Emily. She hasn't drowned Claribeau. Kipper stared at Emily as if she, he'd been struck by lightning and hadn't fallen over yet. It's true, said Emily. She brought Claribel to show me last night after you'd gone. That someone That's the someone else I met. Not just Tilly, but Tilly and Claribel. Kipper finally blinked. Well, I'll be a beach barnacle, as Pa always says. It was a long while before everything that could have been said had been said about this beautiful news, but not until the subject of who had done the terrible deed of telling, if not Tilly, had been thoroughly, um, although unsuccessfully explored. Did Emily finally remember something? Kipper, she gasped. I forgot to tell you. How did you get the key to, to the lock? Kipper grinned wryly. I was com commencing to think about how you would never ask. May I take a seat? Please, said Emily. They both perched on the hard bench with Kipper's little lantern between them, and he told his story. It happens on my way out last night. I get this sudden notion. So I hightail it right to the kitchen, and I pick me a lump of bread from the basket. I pour a dab of water over it and mucks it up real good till it's like a hunk of clay. Then I go off with it to the snake lady's room. You didn't, explained Emily. She was ready, already turning all goosebumps. I did. First I look and there ain't any light coming from under the door. Then I listen and there ain't any sound except for the one old snake lady snoozing. When I, I happened to know that sound on account of one time when I was cleaning her chimney, she dropped off and she didn't snore when she, she don't snore when she snoozes, she snarls, spits too right through her teeth. So hearing this familiar snoozing tune, I opened the door, which luckily ain't locked. I slid in, slippery as a fish. Emily, all attention, shifted nervously on the bench. Kipper lowered his voice to a hush, thoroughly, thoroughly relishing the telling of this tale to such a responsive audience. Well, there's her big ring of keys hanging right beside her bedpost. Ain't no need to ask anyone which key's the one to the remembrance room because it's standing out clearer than a whale in a bucket of old sardines, as Pa would say. So I lift up that key and press it into my mucked up bread lump. I got me the perfect image of that key, and this here's one's made right from that bread lump. How do you think of that, Emily? What? What I think of it is that you might have been caught. You shouldn't have done it, said Emily and then added in a rush of words, but I'm so glad you did. Kipper beamed. After that, they just sat on the bench, swinging their legs happily. Then Kimber, Kipper picked up his lantern and shone around the room. The little spot of light explored the walls and ceiling and finally arrived at the floor. There it stopped. The spotlight had discovered a darkened slab of wood fitted so closely into the stone floor it might have been part of the floor itself, except it was fastened on one side with a heavy, rusted padlock. Emily started when she saw it. Hey, Kipper explained softly. Look at that, Emily. Appears to me to be the cover of something. Well, but what's a well doing in here? Long, long ago, Emily said, I remember Uncle twice telling Papa of a well in the cellar of Sugar Hill Hall. He said he never bothered to open it up since it wasn't needed. This might be that well, Kipper, but, but, but what, Emily? Why do you get that peculiar look on your face? I, I, Emily stammered, oh, Kipper, if I tell you, you'll say I'm addled again. I thought I was addled too, and I imagined the whole thing. What whole thing, said Kipper impatiently. Ain't any way I can decide about it if you don't tell me, Emily. Well, sometime before you came tonight, about 11 o'clock, I heard voices, and it seemed as if they came from under the floor. From under this very room, Kipper. Voices? Kipper looked curiously at Emily. From under this room? There, exclaimed Emily. You see, you do think I'm addled. No such thing, Emily. You you mean you do believe I did hear them? Kipper nodded. Of course I do. I ain't surprised about anything that could happen in this spooky mansion. Did you hear what the voices was saying? They were too far away and hollow sounding, Emily replied. But do you suppose there might be another cello, cellar under this one and a well and not a well at all? Perhaps Uncle Twice just thought it was a well? Ain't... Ain't anyone ever told me about any cellar deeper than this one, Emily. But I ain't to say there ain't one. Nobody told me about no well either. 
Kimber studied the old slab of wood and then suddenly was down on his knees beside it. He twisted the old lock in his hands and after he studied it for a moment, tried jabbing his key into it. The key fit. Quickly, he wiggled it back and forth. There was a squeal of metal against rusty metal and the old lock finally released its ancient rusty grip. Kipper looked up at Emily with wild, excited eyes. Now we'll see what we shall see. Be careful, Emily cried. If it is the well, I ain't gonna drop into any old well. Never fear, said Kipper. He removed the lock and then, with several sharp tugs and a long pull, lifted the heavy slab of wood. Clouds of choking dust flew out of the edges. Holding up his lantern, Kipper peered down over the ledge in the dark black hole. Dingus, Emily, he breathed. This ain't any well. It's steps going down someplace. Come look. Emily inched over towards Kipper. A moment later, she was looking at the flight of stone steps so long and blackened. With filth and age, they seemed like stairs to the middle of the world. Hello, down there, Kipper called out softly. Down there, down there, down there, came echoing back. That's a long stairwell, he said. If it goes to any other cellar, it must be a million do a jillion miles down. He waved his lantern and the eerie shadows danced on the ancient steps. Would you like to see what's down there, Emily? Would you? Kipper asked right back. Um, would you like to see what's down there? Asked Emily. Would you? Kipper asked right back. His eyes were huge in the lantern light. Emily hesitated a moment and finally nodded. All right then, Kipper gulped. I'll go first with the lantern. As if some unknown horror was going to rise up from the pit and grab him by the leg, Kipper put a hesitant foot on the first step and started down. Emily followed as close as she could behind him. It seemed a half mile later before they set foot off the last step and Kipper raised his lantern over his head to shine it around them. Wee He gave a long, low whistle. It ain't a well nor cellar. It's a tunnel. Looks like the inside of a serpent's belly, don't it? Kipper spoke with the authority of having seen several. Look at them walls, black with the breath of fire and that slime oozing out of its innards. Emily shivered uncontrollably. The feeble glow of the lantern was barely able to break through the chill, dark air, heavy with mold and decay. To pick out here and there the evil gleam of the slimy walls. It seemed as if she and Kipper must surely be the first living things to have ever entered the serpent since it decided to rock centuries, since it turned to rock centuries earlier. But as Kipper slowly lowered the lantern to shine it out on a rough kind of path under them, its light picked up a tiny sparkle from something lying at their feet. Emily stooped quickly to pick up the small object that made it and then held it out in her hand to Kipper. It lay like a brass button marked with stars and anchors. It was dented as if having been stepped on heavily, but hardly tarnished, as if it had recently fallen there. Captain Skurlock? Emily whispered, questioning. Maybe, Kipper said. He lifted the button from Emily's hands and held it close to the lantern. We're one of his ugly crew, but doing what? Looks more, looks like more questions, Emily. He shoved the button into his pocket and then raised the lantern, shining it to the left of where they stood. The light revealed a solid wall of blackened rock only a few feet away. See? Ain't any way out of this tunnel excepting the way we just came down. And we both knew there ain't anyone but us has used them steps in a long, long time. Looks like they just been using this as a meeting place, though beats me why. There's lots of cozier places in the world. Kipper paused to shine his lantern in the opposite direction. The light hit a solid wall as well, but only of darkness, not rock. This is where they come from, Emily, whoever they be. Gotta admit, I'm scared to go on. But right now, curious is getting the better of coward. You game to go on? Emily wanted to shake her head. She did not want to go into that terrifying blackness, but there were still questions, so many questions to be answered. What if the tunnel would provide her with the answers? One answer, any answers. I'm game, Emily said. Thought you would be, said Kipper. They started down the grim, dark tunnel. All right, chapter 14 is next. I'm trying to see how many chapters we have. There's only 18. So we will read 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. We will be done probably by next week, Monday-ish. I am so excited because it's getting to be my favorite part of the book. 
I love like from the tunnel on has always been my favorite. I hope you guys have an amazing day or evening whenever you're watching this and I will see you soon. Bye.